or complex issues, you would think at the very least the vote would be close. But the vote was not close at all. The vote was 14 to 1. The only dissenting vote came from the American judge, Thomas Bergenthal, and even his dissent was highly qualified. He issued a statement which was not called a dissent, but he used a more neutral language, namely a declaration. And in his declaration, he stated that there is much in the majority opinion with which I agree. And then at the very end, he turned to the core issue in the conflict, namely the Israeli settlements. It's the core issue for the obvious reason that Israel doesn't want to occupy territories for their scenic value. It wants to exploit the resources that are available there. If the settlements become illegal, then the game is up. Israel has no interest in preserving the, its, core, its uh, control of the occupied Palestinian territories. What does Judge Bergenthal decide? He says, bear in mind, this is the only negative vote. Bergenthal says there can be no question that under international law, the Fourth Geneva Convention, all the settlements are illegal which is to say on what are alleged to be the most controversial issues bearing in the Israel-Palestine conflict, the vote is at minimum 14 to 1. And on the core issue, the vote is effectively 15 to 0. That doesn't sound very controversial. Only one issue then remains the question of the refugees. As I said earlier, the United Nations General Assembly resolution, which always gets a lopsided vote in its favor, includes a passage stating the Palestinian refugees have a right to return or and compensation. If we steer away again from that allegedly politicized body, the obvious place to look for enlightened opinion on the topic would be the respected human rights organizations in the world. So if I were to ask you what's the most respected human rights organization in the world today, you would answer Amnesty International. Well, Amnesty International in 2001 issued a policy statement on the question of the Palestinian refugees. And it stated, quote, we call for Palestinians who fled or were expelled from Israel, the West Bank or Gaza Strip, along with those of their descendants who have maintained genuine links with the area to be able to exercise their right to return. That's amnesty. If we were to turn now to the other most respected human rights organization in the world, it would be Human Rights Watch. And as it happens, Human Rights Watch also issued a statement in 2000 on the question of the refugees. It stated, and I quote, we urge Israel to recognize the right to return for those Palestinians and their descendants who fled from territory that is now within the state of Israel and who have maintained appropriate links with that territory. As you'll notice, the language is virtually identical to Amnesty International's language for the simple reason that these are not controversial questions in international law. These are the most basic principles, the tenets of international law. If we then move away from the global organizations and we move to the regional organization, it's the same picture. The Arab League, the most representative political body in the Arab world, in 2002, then 2007, then 2008, issued a peace plan for resolving the conflict. The peace plan called for a two-state settlement on the June 1967 border a just resolution of the refugee question based on the right of return and compensation. The Arab League actually went one step beyond the international consensus. It also said if Israel agreed to these conditions, they would normalize relations with Israel, meaning trade, tourism, and so forth. The vote in the Arab League, the vote was unanimous, no dissents, 2002, 2007, 2008. The Palestinian Authority has agreed to these terms. The main opposition in, uh, in the occupied territories, Hamas, has formally agreed to these terms. And that leaves us with the basic picture being rather uncomplicated and uncontroversial. There's a consensus among all parties in the world, bar two, 
if we leave aside for the moment the South Sea powerhouses, uh, there's a consensus in the entire world bar t apart from two countries. And then the challenge becomes, as ought to be obvious, the challenge becomes how to get Israel and the United States to respect international law and public opinion. That's the, that's the obstruction, Israel and the United States. And then the challenge is, how do you remove this obstruction? How do you get the United States and Israel, or Israel backed by the United States, to respect international law and the enlightened opinion of humankind? And what I'll try now to do is to suggest that Gandhi, who faced a similar problem, namely how to end the British occupation of India, uh, he worked out a strategy for trying to end it. And what I would like to do now is look at it. Parts of it you'll be familiar with, if not through having read Gandhi, then through having seen films about him, or just through, as it were, passed down wisdom. Part of the Gandhi I'm about to describe will be familiar to most people in this room, but another part of the Gandhi I think will be very surprising to many of you. At any rate, it came as something bordering on a shock uh, when I read it uh, the past couple of months. I have to begin with some caveats. Number one, it's very difficult to make generalizations about Gandhi. His collected works run to some 90 volumes. He lived a very long and very productive life. Gandhi was not one for light-hearted moments. He said, any moment spent in idleness or frivolity is a sin against God. Uh, and uh, he apparently lived that life. Uh, yes, he really did live that life. He was, for all his virtues, which are many, I do think he was just a wee bit too humorless. But um, he lived a very productive life, and it's hard to make generalizations. Uh, although he himself, you can tell his basic creed, I wouldn't call it philosophy, his basic creed remained quite consistent over his life. His only main, his one major work, which is also rather modest in size, Hind Swaraj, uh, he wrote it in 1909, but 30 years later he was still saying he has... Uh, he still considers it an accurate exposition of his views, which seem to remain very consistent. He was like most of us, most mortals. Uh, he was filled with contradictions. He's the best known, or seems to be the best known pacifist in the world. But as some of you know, he supported the British during the Boer War. He supported the British during the Zulu War. And during World War I, he was recruiting Indians to fight in the British Army. Doesn't sound like much of a pacifist. He was taken to task for it. Uh, but Gandhi was somewhat averse, I think, to admitting to his inconsistencies. I won't call it hypocrisies because I have too high regard for him to use that kind of word. He uh, he's, tries too hard to be consistent. I would call him a hypocrite. We'll just call him inconsistent. Uh, and you find statements in his collected works. He contradicts himself literally from day to day and week to week. One day he'll say that Hitlerism and Churchillism are in fact the same thing. He refuses to distinguish between the two during World War II. But then on another day he'll say there's a fundamental difference between fascism and British imperialism. It uh, doesn't sound like you can easily reconcile those statements. I think if you confronted Gandhi, he wouldn't particularly care that much because he liked to say in his own words, I'm essentially a man of action and a reformer. I'm a practical reformer. Basically for him, anything that works and is moral, that's a crucial qualification, anything that works and is moral, uh, he'll go with it because he wants to change the world whether it's consistent is not as important. It's also difficult to subject Gandhi's analysis to rational analysis uh, because it was so deeply steeped in faith. As he said, it is faith that sustains me and it is faith that must sustain the other satyagrahis, the other practitioners of nonviolent resistance. When he decides whether or not to go on a fast, 